They understand it when you present them with the raw evidence. She gets it. This is a woman that was considering doing it, considering going through it. And the second she sees the baby, she's like, can't go through with it. It just amazes me. And if you want to know why the left does not want people to see ultrasounds of their babies, that's it right there. Because they know when they do, then that's the end of the ball game for most people. That ends the argument right there. Hey, fellow tacticians, be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. That was stupid. I know it was stupid. Really stupid. Hey, I just said it was stupid. All right, welcome back, everybody. And for today's Daily Dose of Stupid, I had to do this one because I love it when you watch people on the left, and it's it's so hilarious to watch. It's like they can't actually hear themselves. It's crazy. But sometimes you run into people that are so swept up and so engrossed in their own ideology. Like, they're so enslaved to it, they can't think critically about it. And they think everything, regardless of what it is or what the merits of it actually are, confirmed their already predetermined belief. So like a great example of this that we did on a Daily Dose of Stupid, I think it actually wound up being one of my top five Daily Doses of Stupid, or maybe it was just an honorable mention, but you remember a while back, Ibram X. Kendi, who is the guy who's been out perpetrating critical race theory and is one of the national leaders on black liberation theology and all that stuff. So you remember that he tweeted out something that showed that college kids that were white were actually lying about their ethnicity to try to get a leg up in college admissions and tweeted it out trying to say that this proved what he had been saying when actually the exact opposite was true. It was disproving the things that he had been saying about white privilege and how white people have all the advantages. But he's so engrossed in his ideology, he didn't even see it. He didn't even think maybe there's a thing that might point out some flaws in my theory. And so kind of the same thing has happened here. And of course, since this is the abortion special, it's, it's regarding abortion. The Washington Post put out a piece the other day and they it's almost like they didn't read their own article. And the thing that's so funny about this is this had to have gone through multiple different levels, but everybody at the Washington Post is so deeply entrenched in the pro-abortion movement that nobody read this and was like, aren't the details of this story kind of disproving the things we're trying to say? And I'm not exaggerating here. The details, the pictures, the headline, everything about this article screams pro-life to the point that there are one or two sentences that are telltale signs that they were trying to make it a pro-abortion article. But if you, and I'm not, I'm trying not to be overly generous or, or uh, oversell it, but really, you could change maybe three, four, five sentences in this article. And this is a very long article. It's at least three or four times longer than the average WAPO article. You could change like maybe three to five sentences in this whole article and put it on Life News and you would not be able to tell the difference. Like it would just look like a pro-life story to you. Um, like I said, there are a couple sentences in there that kind of portray that they're trying to paint this in a bad light. But maybe they just couldn't. Maybe they couldn't find out a way to wire work it. But I really do think that the utter lack of self-awareness just finally caught up to them. And since I've already been making a lot of pro-life arguments, I'm not going to like rebut everything that they say, but I do want to go through this article really quickly. And I'm going to read most of the article just because some of the points it's making, the tone deafness just jumps off the page. So let's go ahead and look at this uh, abortion article from the Washington Post. And like I said, even the headline portrays a pro-life stance, even though they're trying to be anti-life. This Texas teen wanted an abortion. She now has twins. Again, if you saw that on Life News, you would not be able to tell that that was originally not a Life News story. And it tells the story of Brooke Alexander, who did find out that she was pregnant two days before the Texas abortion ban took place. And you can see there with the picture, that's her changing one of the babies, uh, beautiful babies, the her her husband or future husband i get well i guess now he is her husband because they had the wedding ceremony but um the father is back there watching she's changing the babies and so throughout this article it's going to try to make the case that this woman's life is now 
wrecked and ruined and it's it's she's far worse off now than she was if she had been able to get rid of the babies but really if you read the details of the story it kind of tells the exact opposite so let's go ahead and jump into this corpus christi texas brooke alexander turned off her breast pump at 604 p.m and brought two fresh bottles of milk over to the bed where her three-month-old twins lay flat on their backs red-faced and crying running on four hours of sleep the 18-year-old tried to feed both babies at once, holding Kendall in her arms while she tried to get Olivia to feed herself, her bottle propped up by a pillow. But the bottle kept slipping and the baby kept wailing, and Brooke's boyfriend, Billy High, wouldn't be home for another five hours. Please, fussy girl, Brooke whispered. She peeked outside the room just big enough for a full-size mattress and realized that she had barely seen the sun all day. The windows were covered by blankets pinned up with thumbtacks to keep the room cool, Brooke rarely ventured outside the rest of the house. Billy's dad had taken them in when her mom kicked them out, and she didn't want to get in his way. So real quickly here, just a, a quick analysis of what's going on here. Um, again, it's going to try to portray this in a, a bad light. And, you know, to be fair, what she's going through there is a rough time. That, that is a stressful and frustrating day. But they act as though that that's going to completely outweigh the fact that she has two beautiful children that she takes care of. There are women that would kill for this. I mean, yeah, they may not like the four hours of sleep, and yeah, they may not always like having to care for the babies at all times, but this is what little girls dream about. Most little girls, when they're, they're little, they, they want to be married and they want to have kids. Now, there are some exceptions to that, sure, and it's not like every woman has to do that. But the point is, they try to portray this as like, this is the worst thing that could have ever happened to someone, and how dare Republicans be against abortion because this is what they've subjected her to. And you're reading this, and you're like, okay, she's having a rough day. It's not that big a deal. <laughs> it really isn't. Uh, and they, they try to do this the whole time. They're, they're trying to overemphasize the negative, but really most of it is extraordinarily positive. And as bad as it is to have to deal with some of the things that she's dealing with, that's just normal life stuff. It's not like some kind of great tragedy. I mean, good gracious, if I could, four hours of sleep is kind of normal for me, and I don't even have kids. Well, I mean, I do have kids, but they're not my kids. <laughs> I have 140 college students. But anyway, my point in all of that is, this is not like wildly outside the norm. Maybe it's wildly outside the norm for the the twenty something teeny boppers that are riding for Wapo, but it's definitely not uh, for her, for for this lady. So uh, they try to make this case, but they just kind of fall on their face here. So let's go ahead and look at the next piece of this. Brooke found out she was pregnant late on the night of August 29th. Two days before the Texas Heartbeat Act banned abortions once an ultrasound can detect cardiac activity. Around six weeks of pregnancy, it was the most restrictive abortion law to take effect in the United States in nearly 50 years. For many Texans who have needed abortion since September, the law has been a major inconvenience, forcing them to drive hundreds of miles and pay hundreds of dollars for legal procedure they, would, they could have had at home. But not everyone has been able to leave the state. Some people couldn't take time away from work or afford gas, while others faced with a long journey decided to stay pregnant. Nearly 10 months into the Texas law, they have started having babies they never planned to carry them. Oh, the horror! I love how they portray this. You'll look at the top. It says, uh, for Texans who needed abortions. Look, guys, I'm sorry to bust the Washington Post's bubble. Nobody needs an abortion. Nobody needs an abortion. When you're talking about issues of pregnancy where it involves life of the mother, you're talking about significantly less than even 1% of abortions. And even then, even in those situations, Normally, there's a way around it, or it's technically classified medically as an abortion, but the baby's actually already passed, and so there'd be no abortion law that would prevent them from getting that medical procedure. And so the whole uh, medical necessity for abortion is kind of a misnomer, and it's obvious that they're saying right there in the article, these people that are needing abortions, they don't need an abortion. They want an abortion. There is a different thing. It's like we have to talk to them like they're three-year-olds. There's a difference in a want and a need. So anyway, that's the case that they're going to try to make, but let's continue on. So they have started having babies they never planned to carry. Oh no, the horror, babies are being born. Cats living with dogs, real Old Testament stuff. Anyway, 
Texas offers a glimpse of what much of the country could face if the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade this summer. Remember that this was written uh, about a day before Roe v. Wade dropped, or the, the Dobbs case dropped. As has been widely expected since the leaked draft opinion circulated last month. If the landmark precedent falls, roughly half the states in the country are expected to dramatically restrict abortion or ban it altogether, creating vast abortion deserts that will push many into parenthood. Okay, so here's the funny thing. You don't push people into parenthood. A person that is having sex opts into at least the possibility of parenthood. That's the way that it works. That would be like saying, uh, if you have a sandwich, then the state is forcing you into digestion. No, that's your body just working. Or it would be like if, um, you know, you turn, if you're a boy, you turn like 12, 13, 14, and you start growing hair in weird places. And, you know, it's like they're, it's forced puberty. It's not forced puberty. That's just the way your body works, you dingus. Like, it's because they think the state is all powerful and the state is God and can do things that natural occurrences of the human body, natural functions of the human are somehow the responsibility of the state. And if you are going through them, see, this is the problem. The Democrats' enemy is biology, not the state. They think that the state is the thing that solves biology because biology is a thing to be overcome. Because women shouldn't be having babies and women should be exactly the same as men and the abortion gives them that. That's what Ruth Bader Ginsburg actually argued is that uh, you know women are not really equal to men unless they can abort their children because men don't have to deal with pregnancy. Look, men and women are different. Deal with it. Like, we die earlier, okay? Like, there's a lot. Of, it's just a reality of life. The government cannot make everything the same for men and women just because we happen to be biologically different. There's differences there. We, we tend to die more from heart attacks, things like that. So I'm sorry, that's just biological reality. But to the left, biology and science and reality are all the enemy. So that's something that the state is supposed to overcome. Let's go ahead and look at the next one. Sometimes, Brooke imagined her life if she hadn't gotten pregnant. And if Texas hadn't banned abortion just days after she decided she wanted one, she would have been in school, rushing from class to her shift at Texas Roadhouse, eyes on a real estate license that would finally get her out of Corpus Christi. She pictured an apartment with Austin in Austin and enough money for a trip to Hawaii, where she would swim with the dolphins in water so clean that she could see her toes. Now, nothing wrong with any of that. Nothing wrong with wanting to be a real estate agent. Nothing wrong with working at Texas Roadhouse. Nothing wrong with being able to save up money for Hawaii and go swimming. Been there. Gorgeous. Probably the most gorgeous state in the union. But the idea that a one-time vacation and a career as a realtor is going to be more fulfilling than bringing a life into the world is a little bit of a misnomer. And you might say, well, maybe she didn't want to. If she didn't want the baby, she didn't have to keep the babies. And I'm not talking about abortion. If she did not care about those babies, she would have put them up for adoption. We know this. She still has the option of doing that, actually. Um, but the the fact that she didn't, that means that she actually does care for her children and she chose that. And so they're trying to paint this thing like that's vastly superior. Like going to Hawaii is a one-time trip is vastly superior to the life that she has now. And I don't pretend to know everything about her life. And I'm sure her life is very difficult in many ways. Everybody's life is. Um, I'm sure that there's a lot of things she has to deal with that I don't because I'm not a parent and I'm not a mom. But they they keep trying to portray this as like, you know, this Texas law just ruined her life. And I'm just sitting here like, really? That was the alternative? That That's fine, but it doesn't really seem like, you know, you're not exactly living the, the best life you possibly could. It's just bizarre how they're trying to portray this. So let's go ahead and look at the next one. Leaving Billy in her bedroom with the pregnancy test, Brooke grabbed her keys and drove to her best friend's house, where they sat on the bed and examined her options. She could always get an abortion, she told him. Then he reminded her of something she vaguely remembered seeing on Twitter. A new law was scheduled to take effect September 1st. Brooke had 48 hours. The abortion clinic in South Texas, two and a half hours from Corpus Christi, had no open slots for the next few days, with patients across the state racing to get into clinics before the law came down. When Brooke called, the woman at the end of the line offered the names, 
and addresses of clinics in New Mexico, a 13-hour drive from Corpus Christi. You know, this is another thing that the left keeps talking about. They're scared to death. It's like nobody will be able to get an abortion. I mean, granted, I'm not glad that they can. I wish that that was not the case. But, it, you know, a 13-hour drive to get an abortion, um, there are people that have to drive 13 hours for, like, actual medical procedures that they need. So, I, you know, to act as though this is this major inconvenience and there will be no more abortions anymore, believe me, I wish that were the case. It's not the case. In the meantime, the woman said Brooke could get an ultrasound somewhere nearby. If she was under six weeks, they could still see her. We're going to see how far along it is, Brooke texted her dad. Jeremy Alexander later that night. See if an adoption, uh, see if an abortion is an option. What's the cutoff date? He asked. They just passed the law today, she responded in the early hours of September 1st, referring to the ban that had just taken effect. Where are the odds it'd be, I believe, it's six weeks? Fingers crossed, her dad said. Brooke found a place that would perform an ultrasound on short notice and she scheduled an appointment for 9 a.m. Okay, first of all, there's something deeply wrong and cynical with a person that is crossing his fingers and hoping against all hope that his pregnant daughter will have the ability to murder his grandchildren. Like, we find out later that this guy actually is a deadbeat dad. Um, but, like, the fact that he's addicted to cocaine, to me, is like a minor issue compared to the fact that he's wanting his daughter to be able to kill her children. That's, that's a level of demonic cynicism I can't even fathom. Uh, but anyway, so that's where we stand on that terrible, terrible father. All right. So a little later on in the same article, whenever a new client walks into the pregnancy center of Coastal Benton, so these are the bad guys they're about to portray. These are the, uh, the, the crisis pregnancy center people. They are asked to fill out a form after all the usual qu questions of name, date of birth and marital status, uh, comes the one that most interests the staff. If you are pregnant, what are your intentions? From there, the team sorts each client into one of three groups. They are planning to have the baby, LTC, likely to carry. They're on the fence, AV, abortion vulnerable. And they're planning to get an abortion, AM, abortion minded. The Pregnancy Center of Coastal Bend, which advertises itself as the number one source of abortion information in the region, is one of thousands, thousands of crisis pregnancy centers across the United States, anti-abortion organizations that are religiously affiliated. Oh no! Religious... I'm sorry. I can't hold it in. Religiously affiliated clinics trying to save children. How dare they? Anyway, when Brooke showed up uh, with her mom for an appointment, she had no idea she'd walked into a facility designed to dissuade people from getting abortions. She also didn't know how much significance her, fr uh, her form held for the staff. By signaling that she wanted an abortion, she became the first AM of the Texas Heartbeat Act. Yeah, so they're, they're going to try to portray these people as the villains. They're just a bunch of religious zealots. Look, religion may inform the reason that they're so against abortion and may want to try to save children, but you could say that about anything. Like, there are a ton of religiously based organizations centered around stopping child sex slavery. Are we supposed to believe that they're the bad guys just because they happen to be religiously affiliated? I don't know. The, Washington Post actually might. I'm not sure. Um, but they, they do try to paint them in this negative light and paint them as though they're kind of, uh, you know, this creepy cult that is only there to prey on vulnerable women thinking about, you know, not killing their children. <laughs> it's the height of insanity, the way that these people think, the way that these people talk about children and the way that they talk about mothers as well. I, it, it really is disgusting. So let's go ahead and get to the next part. The advocate assigned to her case, Angie Arnholt, had been counseling abortion-minded clients at the pregnancy center for, for a year. While many of the center's volunteers signed up to only talk to LTCs to have happy conversations about babies, their clients couldn't wait to have Arnholt, a 61-year-old who wears a gold cross around her neck. Oh my gosh, can you believe the, <laughs> the audacity? Felt called to do what she would to help pregnant women make a good decision, she later told the Washington Post. Yeah, she sounds like a real monster. Back in the consultation room, Brooke told Arnholt all the reasons she wanted to get an abortion. She had just enrolled in real estate classes at a community college, 
which would be her first time back in the classroom since she dropped out of high school three years earlier at 15. She and Billy had been dating only three months. Sitting across from Brooke and her mom, Arnholt opened A Woman's Right to Know, an anti-abortion booklet distributed by the state of Texas, flipping a pa to a page titled Abortion Risk. The first risk listed was death. So you'll notice there that it's like the, the anti-abortion clinic and the anti-abortion uh, book. Now, they could just as easily say pro-life book or pro-life clinic. They don't do that because they think somehow saying that they're anti-abortion is some kind of like horrible slam on them. If they're anything like me, and I'm assuming they are, I'm pretty sure they take that as a compliment. So again, you can tell by the language, they're very much trying to cast these guys in some kind of like sinister light, but being anti-abortion is a good thing and they see it that way too. So like, you're really just, you're, you're trying to, you're throwing out an insult that doesn't hit the mark there. But anyway, as Brooke listened to Arnholt's warnings of depression, nausea, cramping, breast cancer, and infertility, she tried to stay calm, reminding herself that women get abortions all the time. Well, right, but that doesn't mean that there aren't side effects. Still, Brooke couldn't help fixating on some of the words Adderholt used. Vacuum suction, heavy bleeding, punctured uterus. Serious complications from abortion are rare. Abortion does not increase the risk of mental illness, breast cancer, or infertility, according to leading medical organizations. Now, see, you notice that they say leading medical organizations, not like a community of medical organizations. What they're doing there is they're citing specifically their medical organizations, the ones that they prefer. In other words, the ones that actually do show that these things are a legitimate concern for women that may be considering getting an abortion, and when they get an abortion, these are some of the side effects of it, they don't, they just discard those because they disagree with their narrative. So when they say leading medical organizations, they're not even saying most medical organizations, they're saying specifically the ones we cherry picked to make this point in the article. So that being said, let's go on to the next point. Starting to panic, Brooke looked over at her mom. When she found that Brooke was pregnant, Terry Thomas told her daughter to get an abortion. When she while she was a devout Christian, going to church a few times a week and twice on Sundays. Okay, she might actually be a devout Christian, but that's not what makes you a devout Christian. She had her own views on this particular issue. Ah, there we go. Not a devout Christian. Thomas had her first kid at 20. She said just as she was transferring out of community college with hopes of starting law school. If the timing had been different, she said, she might have been a prosecutor. Instead, she hopped from one retail job to another, Bath and Body Works, to Walgreens, to Home Depot. Growing up, Brooke said she bounced back and forth between her mom's house and her dad's, depending on who was the more stable parent at the time. Her happiest years as a kid were spent with her dad. She said on a three-line street with a ping-pong table in the garage and a trampoline in the backyard. But then Brooke's dad started using cocaine, you know, which might explain why he's cheering for his grandchildren to be brutally murdered. Arnholt ushered Brooke into the ultrasound room, where Brooke undressed from the waist down and lay back on an examination table, looking up at a flat screen TV. The ultrasound technician pressed the probe onto her stomach, slathered it with gel. Brooke wheeled up this, uh, wheeled the screen to show a fetus without a heartbeat. The technician gasped. It was twins, and they were 12 weeks along. Are you sure, Brooke said? Oh my God, oh my God. Thomas recalled saying as she jumped up and down, this is a miracle from the Lord. We are having these babies. So Brooke's mom takes one look at the ultrasound and is like, yep, that's a kid. I mean, that goes exactly back to what we were talking about in the earlier segment with our, our guest, Robin Blessing. The vast majority of women you don't have to give them a, a lengthy scientific explanation. You don't have to have a medical degree. Literally, all you have to do is show them a picture of their kid. They're like, yep, that's a baby. I mean, at that point, it's just, it amazes me how often the left, that their argument is trying to make you say, what I see with my own eyes, hear with my own ears, what I can sense with my own senses must not be reality. They are the enemies of reality. Because the second you show people some reality, the vast majority of people, especially women that have that motherly instinct, they get it. It makes sense to them. You can call it a clump of cells all you want, which is a dumb argument because you're a clump of cells too. Every human is a clump of cells. 
But you can call it a clump of cells all you want. doesn't change the fact that it's still a baby and that when people see it, they understand it's a baby too. Even the vast majority of people like these two women that would consider themselves pro-choice. So let's get, again, somehow this is supposed to be a pro-abortion article. <laughs> so let's go back to that. Brooke felt like she was floating above herself, watching a scene from below. Her mom was calling the twins my babies, promising Brooke she would take care of everything as the ultrasound technician told her how much she loved being a twin. If she really tried, Brooke thought, she could make it to New Mexico. Her older brother would probably lend her the money to get there, but she couldn't stop staring at the pulsing yellow line on the ultrasound screen. If her babies had heartbeats, as these women said that they did, was aborting them murder. Eventually, Arnholt turned to Brooke and asked whether she'd be keeping them. Brooke heard herself saying yes. So, goes back to exactly what I was saying just a minute ago. The second that she sees the babies, the second that she looks at them, the thought goes into her head, well, if they have heartbeats, isn't killing them wrong? Those aren't my hearts. I have a heart. Those two hearts are not my heart. She doesn't have three hearts. She doesn't have three bodies. Th those are somebody else's bodies. They understand it when you present them with the raw evidence. She gets it. This is a woman that was considering doing it, considering going through it. And the second she sees the baby, she's like, can't go through with it. It just amazes me. And, and if you want to know why the left does not want people to see ultrasounds of their babies, that's it right there. Because they know when they do, then that, that's the end of the ballgame for most people. That ends the argument right there. So let's go ahead and uh, look at the rest of this article here. After that, Brooke didn't go back to the pregnancy center. She said that the class, talking about the class that was at the pregnancy center, felt like a waste of time. Instead, she turned to Billy. Within a few weeks, Brooke and Billy had a plan. He would join the Air Force as soon as he graduated from high school. Brooke would wait for him to finish basic training, then follow him wherever he got assigned. Soon, they were debating baby names. Surrounded by their friends and family one afternoon in October, Brooke and Billy fired uh, general gender reveal cannons into Thomas's backyard, unleashing two giant puffs of pink smoke. Which, again, that not only cuts against the left's ideas about whether or not a baby is actually a baby or not, but also cuts against their idea of uh, the fact that gender exists and is an actual thing. But anyway, let's continue. I'm so happy I met you, Billy, Brooke wrote in an Instagram post announcing her pregnancy. Starting a family with you is going to be one of the hardest things I'm ever going to experience. Yes, true, but I'm glad I get to do it with you. Okay, so even Brooke, the mom in the story, is saying, yes, it's going to be hard, but it's going to be a good thing that I get to do. <laughs> How do these people come up with this stuff? How do they think that this somehow makes their case? Brooke stated her real estate started her real estate classes in early November. Okay, so despite all of this going on, she still goes to her real estate school. And she loved everything about it, about going to school. When she showed up the first day in her favorite crop top and jeans, the cinder block building felt like an opportunity, she said. Most days she'd buy a frappuccino from the vending machine and sit down in the chair she claimed is her own, opening her textbook to a page she had already covered in yellow highlighter. Brooke got an 83 on the final exam. The highest grade in the class. Okay, so she got actually got to uh, take some of the classes and did that even though the whole point of this article is she doesn't get to do that now because of her babies. And uh, let's keep going. Looking at her daughters, Brooke struggled to articulate her feelings on abortion. On one hand, she said she absolutely believed that a woman should have the right to choose what's best for their own lives. On the other, she knew that without the Texas law, her babies might not be here. So in other words, she can't imagine losing her babies, and because of that, she actually, in a roundabout way, is grateful for the Texas law for taking that option off the table for her. Again, somehow this is supposed to be a pro-abortion article, and I just don't get it. Anyway, it continues on. Who's to say what I would have done if the law wasn't into effect, she said. I don't want to think about it. Well, yeah, I bet you don't. Um, I wouldn't either. I'm glad that you didn't have that option. 
Brooke considered all that she had lost. Long nights at the skate park, trips to the mall, dropping a $30 on a crab dinner just because she felt like it. It really, uh, I really just can't be free, she said. I guess that really sums it up. That's a big thing that I really miss, she said silently for a while, Olivia's hand wrapped around her finger. It's really scary thinking that I wouldn't have them, she said. There was only one way that she could make sense of it, she said. Losing them now as fully formed human beings would be different from losing them back then. Okay, now this is where my expertise and somebody who used to write newspaper stories is going to come in handy. I can't prove this. This is just speculation on my part, but I have a suspicion here. You notice how at the end, they don't actually quote her, but they paraphrase her. I could be wrong, but based on everything leading up to that sentence, it seems as though Brooke has turned a new leaf on her opinion on the abortion things. It seems that she hasn't quite left her position of being pro-choice, at least in some manner. But it seems like all the stuff that she believed about taking a baby's life beforehand is pretty much gone at this point. And the fact that it says that losing them now as fully formed human beings would be different from losing them back then, I would be willing to bet a lot of money that the actual quote says something kind of along those lines, but that the author reworded it in such a way to make it sound more like she's more pro-choice than she actually is. Could be wrong. Maybe it says something very akin to that and they just edited for time. But I don't think I'm wrong on that one. And one thing that I, I would like to bring to your attention looking at that. She says, it's really scary to think that I wouldn't have them. Everything I see in this article indicates to me that this woman who had every intention of killing her own children in the womb when she didn't think of them as children the second that she realized they were, did a complete 180 on it and is actually thankful for the Texas law, a law that she probably would have been against if you would ask her her opinion on it before she actually got pregnant. And see, this is the thing that they don't like to talk about. I know plenty of women, and I have one that I'm actually very close to in my family, that actually claims to be somebody that is pro-choice. And I think part of that comes from they feel like they're bad women and they're, they're betraying women if they don't say that, but their actions say the exact opposite. I won't go into the details of one story in particular that I'm thinking about, but there was a situation that would have been what most people would consider a textbook case of why you should have an abortion. It had, again, I'm not going to go into the details, but the parents were underage and not married. And there were all kinds of, like, like basically every reason you can have to not want a baby other than actual medical concern was in that story, uh, except for rape. Rape was also not concerned. So I guess the, the like big three that people always bring up is the reason. Outside of those reasons, if you're talking about an abortion for convenience, every single part of that formula was there present in that story. And the woman who claims that she's pro-choice refused to go through with it. And so it's just like the, they, they know. Most of them know. The instinct is there. It kicks in. They have been taught their whole life or they've, they've grown up. It's just like people that are stuck in a religion that doesn't make any sense and they don't really understand the religion, but it's what they grew up believing. It's the same thing. They have been taught their whole life that they're bad women if they're not pro-choice, but when it comes time to actually make the decision, even when everything around them would say, this is not the right way to handle it, you need to go ahead and, and abort this child, they know that it's wrong. Their actions speak louder than their words. And this young lady not only went through and had her twins, but actually kept them and stayed with her babies because she cares about them. She loves them. That's part of God making her who she is. And she seems like a perfectly fine and delightful young lady, by the way. I'm not trying to say this to say that the, uh, the family's horrible. I do think the dad might be a little horrible. I mean, he's a coke addict and he's rooting for his kids to be, his grandkids to be murdered. So I give him a little less leeway and maybe that's because I'm a man and I'm harder on men. But regardless, it seems to me that a lot of the people involved in this story are actually really good people. And even if they do consider themselves quote-unquote pro-choice, their actions don't say that. And the story doesn't say that. It says that they actually believe the opposite and that their lives are better for it. A perfect example. It's talking about her not being able to go back to class, and that's unfortunate. But if that's what she decided, wouldn't that indicate that her decisions would sh say that she likes her life now better than she would have if she was in real estate school? And her now husband, instead of 
again, I'm, I'm just being critical because I would have been critical of me at that age too. Uh, so I'm not just saying that he's a horrible human being or anything like that. I think I actually admire him for stepping up and being a dad, but this caused a kid that bums around all day to skate park to actually grow up and have some responsibility. And now he's going to the United States air force. He's becoming a contributing member of society because his children made him better. And it sounds like the mom has grown quite a bit too. And her children have made her better as well. And this is why I say that like everything in this story is ridiculously pro-life. Like I couldn't have pinned a better story than this. If I had tried to, if I was just making it up and could make up the details as I went along, I couldn't make up a story better than this. And so it really does just speak to the fact that the people at the Washington Post are so blinded by their own ideology, they don't see that this obliterates the case for abortion. So we'll go to the next one here. So, by the way, I love this picture. This is a picture of the grandparents. This is the, uh, the father's dad and mom. Anyway, it goes on. <clears throat> to explain the center's work, Pinson told a story about a girl who showed up with her mom. Remember, this is the, uh, the crisis pregnancy center lady. Who showed up with her mom on the morning of the heartbeat act took effect, asking for an abortion. The mother and daughter were so furious with us, Pinson said, so angry. But as soon as they saw the ultrasound, she said everything changed. The moment that we put the wand on her sweet belly and those two babies popped up, it absolutely melted them. Yes, because again... They were confronted with reality. This is what the left hates. They hate it when people are confronted with reality because once you are confronted with reality, you come around to the right's position. Once they saw the truth, the truth set them free from their bad ideology. So that's where we are right now. And this is the final part of it. This is kind of the conclusion of the story. Standing with Billy in front of the Justice of the Peace, Brooke told herself that one day, they would have their own love story moment. She would walk down the aisle in a wedding gown. Their friends and family would cry and cheer And Billy, as she and Billy publicly declared how much they meant to each other. I, Brooke Alexander, take the Billy high to beat my wedded husband, she repeated. If it wasn't for the Texas law, Brooke knew she might not be standing here. She probably would be studying for her next exam while Billy mastered some new trick on the quarter pipe. She'd like to think that she'd still be together, spending their money on movie tickets and Whataburger instead of diapers and baby wipes. She told herself that that alternate life didn't matter anymore. Exactly right. She had two babies she loved more than anything else in the world. I do, she said, with tears in her eyes. Brooke pulled out her phone once they finished the ceremony. One hour, 15 minutes, time to grab some lunch and head home. The babies would be hungry. Again, I, I just don't see how they don't see it. It, it, is, it is astounding to me because that's the end of that story. This couple went from being two irresponsible teenagers to two flourishing members of society. Do they have hardships? Sure. Is their life perfect? No. Are there a lot of sacrifices they have to make for their kids? Absolutely. That's what made them better. That's the irony of this whole thing. The very thing that the Washington Post is trying to castigate and saying, this is terrible and this is horrible. Look at all how, woe is them, how horrible their life is now. That's exactly the thing that makes them better people now. That's what hardship does to people. You know, everybody has different things in their life that has that effect on them. For me, it was cancer. I became a better person after cancer. Yeah, it sucked at the time. That doesn't change the fact that going through an experience like that makes you better. And this is true of most people. Your children tend to make you more responsible because now you have to care about another human life. You realize that your life isn't all about you. And I'm saying this is a childless bachelor. I'm just saying this is an outsider looking in and even I have figured this out. And so the, the idea that all these sacrifices you make for your kids, that's the point of parenthood in the first place. The whole reason that God created us in a system where we have to love one another to procreate. And then through that procreation, we have more love and are better able to understand God's relationship with us. That's the point of families in the first place, guys. That was the point is to make us more like God, to make us more righteous like he is. And that's exactly what this couple experienced. Now the, the man is responsible. He's, and, and props to him, because there's a lot of guys that would have, you know, once that happened, hauled butt out of town. 
But this guy is taking responsibility. He has a family now. He's taking care of them. He's not spending time, you know, just goofing off and doing whatever he wants. He's actually contributing to society. His He has a beautiful wife. He has two beautiful little girls. I mean, like, everything about this story is good. The fact that the Texas law was in effect made the story better. This wouldn't be a story at all, and it certainly wouldn't be a very good story, if that law hadn't taken effect and if she hadn't gone to that pregnancy center and seen those babies and that hadn't saved their lives. It is just astounding to me that these people don't see how this completely undermines everything that they've been telling people. But I do want to mention one last thing before we go on this. The Human Defense Fund, which is a pro-life organization, has actually put together a way to help this couple. They saw a need and they said, you know what? They probably are in need of some things. They need some help. So cool. We're going to do that. And there is a link to where you can go. There's an Amazon registry that you can go to. So you don't have to donate money. Uh, you don't have to like go to GoFundMe or anything like that. We're not going to get shut down by them or anything. You can go to this Amazon registry and they have gifts as low as like $15, $20. And you can buy them and it will send it directly to this couple's house. And I very much recommend that you do that. They seem to be a great couple. Uh, they seem to have two little girls that they really care about and love. And, and I wish them the best and pray for them. And here's the thing. It was like I was saying earlier in the show. If we want the government to do less, we have to do more. If we want bills like Texas to stand and we want states to outlaw abortion, then other states that haven't done that need to see that there are resources and there are people that are available to people caught in situations exactly like this. I want to protect babies just as much as you do. Because if you've watched this much of the show, you probably have already picked up on that. You probably are a pro-life person yourself. And that's great. Glad to have you here. But that also means we have a responsibility to try to take care of people. I'm not saying that us not doing so makes it right. That's not true either. Like, that's a stupid argument and always has been. But whether or not it is, it is also right to try to help people that need it. And so whether it's this couple, and, and the link is in the description below if you want to donate to them, but if you know a couple like this, maybe buy them a month's supply of diapers or, or even just a pack of diapers. Maybe buy them some baby clothes. Maybe, maybe get them some baby toys. Like Help them out when you can. And make sure that we are alert and aware of what is going on around us so that we can help people like this too. Because it's not enough to prevent death. It's also incumbent upon us as followers of Jesus Christ to improve life. And that's really what we can do here. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you made it all the way to the end, it must mean you like what you saw and should like and subscribe. That or you were just super bored, wound up here by accident, and were too lazy to turn the video off before now. Now, I hope you're the first type of person, but if you happen to be the second type, doesn't really matter to me. I got a view out of you either way. Huh. Profiting off of the laziness of others. This must be what it feels like to be a Democrat.